Growing up on or near military bases during my formative years was the closest that I've come to experiencing Martin Luther King's racial democracy. Literally, my father spent 20 years in the US Air Force. And as a result, we traveled around the nation uh, and even the world, representing the United States of America. By the time I graduated from high school, I lived in nine different places. And of course, we pledged allegiance to the flag every day. Uh, twice a day, living on military installations, uh, we would stop uh, when they would stop the, and, and play the, the music uh, to make sure that we were honoring uh, our patriotism. Uh, you could not tell us that we were not Americans, because indeed, we absolutely were. And as an African-American family, only the fourth generation from slavery on my mother's side, we embraced the notion of being American fully, even while we recognize the duality of actually coming from a family that had a history in this nation of being excluded and oppressed. One of my earliest memories is as a young family, we were on our way to Crete, Greece, and we had gone home to visit my parents, where my parents were from, in a small town in West Texas. And we were traveling out of town, and it was during that dusk time, uh, right before it becomes dark. And a police officer stopped us. Now, we were a young family, military, traveling all over the United States, primarily by car. We couldn't afford to fly, uh, fly at that time. Uh, and the officer pulled us over, and he told my father that, you know, he didn't have uh, his lights on. And my father said, well, it's still light outside. And he arrested my dad. And I remember my mom uh, and all of our family members actually coming to the, uh, the police station and watching as they booked my father and, and put him in jail. Uh, and of course, you know, I went on to uh, get a master's degree and a, a PhD in political science because I care passionately about our democracy, and I still do. But I also cared about making sure that this is a democracy where everyone feels included, because that is what this is about. And so I literally created a company uh, where I focus on policy change uh, and political change, making sure that we have solutions uh, to bring us all into uh, the commonality of our shared democracy. And yet, yes, we have a ways to go as a society. And we're still dealing with issues of identity, unity, diversity and inclusion and equity, certainly the notion of belonging. And I would say that up until 2016, that we were actually moving towards a trajectory where we might not be perfect, but we recognize the pathway and what we needed to do to become a more perfect union. And then 2016 happened. And literally, the Pandora's box of hate was opened. And what came out of it were things that we thought we left behind, perhaps in the 20th century, the 19th century, the 18th century. But here they were, right here in the United States of America in the 21st century. We're talking about the politics of hate. We're talking about anti-Semitism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, racism, sexism, ableism, you name it. We're being attacked from within by forces that are intent on dividing us by our latent biases and creating divisions between us that would have us give up on this very notion of a democracy. Indeed, I would argue that we're at our zero moment. This is the moment where we can either crash as a society or we can soar. I can't tell you how dispiriting it is to know right here in this day and age that we as the United States of America are ripping babies out of the arms of their parents at the border in the name of our democracy, that we're literally passing policies at the federal level to exclude people from certain countries, primarily Muslim, primarily from Africa, 
to, to, from coming and entering into this nation. That we're doing these things that perpetuate hate. And yet, what do we know? We know that unless you are a Native American, or unless you are a Latinx, uh, Latinx, Hispanic American from the Southwest, all of the rest of us either came here by foot or by boat or by air. We were immigrants to this country. And of course, nowhere is that more clear than the current occupants of the White House. You know, the certain president who's occupying the White House uh, is the grandson of an immigrant. His wives were immigrants. His children are the sons and daughters of immigrants. And so we should understand that this nation has become what it is because of the contributions of all of us, no matter what we, where we come from. But we can't forget that it's important to realize that we have an opportunity to soar. It was not that long ago where a majority of Americans came together to elect the first African-American president of the United States of America. And we were proud as a nation that we could come together to do this and that we've done things continuously over the years, whether that be passing historic civil rights laws or whether that be, you know, making sure that we're integrating the military so that people could, like me could have an integrated experience growing up. But the fact of the matter is, is that we haven't been paying attention to the fundamental aspect of who we are. And the United States of America is absolutely about unity. The unity that's inherent in us recognizing our commonalities. Recognizing that while we might all come historically from different places and spaces, while we might have had different experiences, we are all right now, right here, in this project called the United States of America. And this enterprise has to continue. It is all of us, up to all of us, to ensure that instead of crashing and burning, that we actually swim and soar. And so, I'm now chair of the Maryland Democratic Party. And uh, recently, I was invited uh, by a guy named Harry Bandari uh, to come to an event. Now, he is the first ever elected Nepalese American, not just in the state legislature of Maryland, but anywhere in the United States of America at any level of government. So I go to this event, and it turns out uh, that it was a Nepali American reunion from all over the country. <laughs> Nepali Americans had driven down from New Jersey, had come from, flown in from Colorado, had come from Chicago, and they all came to see with their own eyes this guy named Harry Bandari. And one woman stood up and she said, let me tell you something, I'm a naturalized citizen. My children are first-generation citizens. We never thought that we would see any Nepali American hold any position in the United States government. But now that we see it's possible, we want more Harry Bandaris all around the country. But we have a problem. We don't know anything about your system. We're here, but we don't know anything about democracy. We don't know how to get our voices heard, and we don't know how to participate. I took that as a challenge. As a political scientist uh, who is focused on making sure that our democracy gets stronger, that we overcome this moment that we're in culturally uh, to come out stronger uh, than ever before, that, that we need to do work. And that work is the work of engagement, it's the work of education, it's the work of mobilization, it's the work to ensure that we leave our democracy intact so that our kids can grow up in a country that we will recognize and be proud of. And so with that, I ask all of you to join me in advancing an inclusion revolution for the nation. And this might be the time that we also do a check to make sure that we're advancing also the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that we're embracing a new declaration not a declaration of independence from a king, but a declaration of interdependence uh, and inclusion that will stand the test of time. Thank you.